Okay, so now we're going to move and we're going to start talking about chromosome mapping in prokaryotes. One of the benefits of using prokaryotes to do things like this is because they grow very, very quickly. They grow exponentially. When they're growing, um, many of these spontaneous mutations can happen, and this is going to be the raw material that we need to look for things like evolution. Okay? So this spontaneous mutation that happens, it's going to occur in the presence, absence of phage. We'll talk about phages in a minute. It's going to be considered the primary source of genetic variation in bacteria. So next we're going to talk about chromosome mapping in prokaryotes. One of the benefits of using prokaryotes for experiments like this is that they grow very, very quickly. They grow exponentially. Another benefit is that they do have some genetic variation, and they get this primarily through mutations. And these mutations are going to be spontaneous. A spontaneous mutation is going to occur in the presence or absence of phage. And we'll talk more about what a phage is in a second, but basically it's going to be a virus that infects a bacteria. This is considered the primary source of genetic variation in these bacteria. So they don't have things like meiosis where they can get this reshuffling, but they do have many other ways that they can get some genetic variation. When we're studying mutants, one of the common ways to look at them is to see what is required for their normal growth. And we can select or perform selection to grow only the organism that we want under condi under conditions in which not only, um, excuse me, only the mutant of interest grows well, but the wild type does not. And so you can do this many times if you're doing, looking for, say, antibiotic resistance of a bacteria, and you want to study that. You can add antibi antibiotics to a plate. Most bacteria should die off. Anything that has your antibiotic resistance gene in it, though, should survive. Another way you can do this is by looking at their ability to synthesize different compounds. So if an organism is what we call a prototroph, it can synthesize everything that it needs to grow. And you can grow it on very minimal medium, just very few things that it needs. It can synthesize everything, all organic, essential organic compounds. Now, we can mutate them, and when we do these mutations, we're going to call them oxytrophs. An oxytroph has lost the ability to synthesize one or more essential compounds. This could be things like various amino acids that they need. You have to provide it with them to, in the medium if you're going to get them to actually grow. When you're growing bacteria for an experiment, there are three main growth phases that they have. The first is the lag phase. When you first put bacteria into a media, it takes some time for the bacteria to um, get used to that media, to acclimate, to start turning on some genes that are involved in replication, and so on. The log phase is next, and this is where the bacteria are going to be experiencing exponential growth. When you're performing experiments with bacteria, typically you're going to look to find ones that are in the log phase, because they're going to be actively growing, and they're going to exhibit many of the traits that you would be looking for in a particular experiment. Once they've reached the carrying, so-called carrying capacity of this medium, you're going to reach a stationary phase. And what you're going to see here is that um, the number of cells is going to level off. And it'll stay a fairly high number. If, for some reason, all of the nutrients in a media are being used up, then you may have this number decreasing. However, in most media, there's plenty of uh, nutrients for it, and it will stay at this high stationary phase. And at this phase, you have equal numbers of bacteria dividing as you do bacteria that are going to be dividing. And you'll, so you'll pretty much always see this characteristic, uh, sort of an S-shaped curve. Bacteria can perform what we call genetic recombination through conjugation. What happens during conjugation is genetic information is directly transferred from one bacterium to another. It can't, this bacteria DNA can recombine with the second bacterium's DNA. It can also exist separately in what we're going to call plasmids, and we'll talk more about those in a minute. Um, in bacterial conjugation in E. coli, uh, F plus cells are going to serve as the donors, and F minus cells are going to be the recipients. Bacterial cells are not male or they're not female, however, they can have this positive or negative fertility factor. The F plus 
cells, again, contain the fertility factor. They have an ability to donate the DNA during conjugation. So in a way, they're somewhat male-like because they are donating their DNA, they're giving it to the other organism. However, uh, again, there is no male and female when we're talking about bacteria. The recipient cells are starting off as F minus. After they receive this fertility factor, they are themselves converted to this F plus as well. So what would happen during this conjugation event? You have an F plus crossed with an F minus cell. You have this F factor on a plasmid. Now a plasmid is going to be a small extra chromosomal double-stranded DNA piece. It is typically going to be circular here. And it's usually quite a bit smaller than the, the chromosome. It can be replicated either at the same time as the bacterial chromosome, or it can be replicated independently of one another. So bacteria that have this F factor are going to promote conjugation through conjugation pili. What's going to happen is these bacteria are literally going to connect to one another, and this chromosome gets nicked, okay. it unwinds, and travels through. This DNA is newly synthesized on this end as well as this end. And so at the end of this, what's going to happen is you're going to have two complete copies in the two different cells. Once this is complete, the conjugation tube is closed. Um, the li there's a ligase will close that circles. Remember, ligase is an enzyme that will seal pieces of DNA together, and the conjugates can separate. And at this point, both of these bacteria are going to be F plus cells. And both of these bacteria can then go on and themselves redo this conjugation event with a new F minus bacterium. Some bacteria have what we call HFR strains, or high frequency of recombination strains. They have that F factor, but it's actually integrated into their, their own chromosome. So it's not on a separate plasma, but it's on their own chromosome. So these types of strains, these HFR strains, can donate genetic information to these F minus cells. However, in these cases, because it's not getting the F plasmid, it is going to remain F minus. So the F plus with the F minus, uh, the recipient does become F plus like we just mentioned. This has a pretty low rate of recombination because at this point, the plasmid is just going to be separate from the chromosome. In these high frequency strains though, they are also going to be donating to the F minus strains, but in this case the recipient remains F minus. In these particular strains, you do have a high rate of recombination happening. And this led to our whole understanding that the, the chromosomes in E. coli were circular. So what they did was what we're going to call interrupted matings. And so they allowed the HFR strain to donate some of the back, some of the, the chromosome, and then they stopped it before it was complete. And so what you can see here, here's a number of different HFR strains, and you can see the order of transfer of um, some of the different parts. What they did was it would start here, okay? Um, if they let it go a little bit, stopped it, okay, let it go a little bit more, stopped it. You can see how many of the genes would make their way through this. You can say in this particular case, it's going to start maybe here. Okay, it's going to go in that direction. And you can see the same, same different components, just in this case, it would be a reverse order. This case, um, it would be going this direction, but it'd be starting down here instead. Here, again, same components, but just starting here and going in this particular direction. And so by stopping this, by looking at the order of transfer of these different genes within this, you can actually determine that this whole chromosome was circular, not linear. There are several different proteins that are going to be essential to this bacterial recombination event. And two of them, Rec-A plays an important role in recombination involving single strand displacement. And the Rec-BCD protein is important for unwinding double-stranded DNA, and that will serve as a source for genetic recombination. And the Rec-A then, once it's single-stranded, uh, can help to facilitate this recombination event. So let's talk more about plasmids. We've talked about these fertility factors, um, but there are many other types. In general, plasmids are composed of a double-stranded closed circle of DNA. They may be one copy in a cell, it may be many copies in the cell. And this is all going to be within the bacterial cytoplasm. These plasmids contain one or more genes. Typically when we're studying this for use in, in um, the lab, it's going to contain at least 
three to four genes of interest, and these are going to replicate independently of the bacterial chromosome. When we're using these in a lab, we're typically going to use marker genes, and we're going to use things like antibiotic resistance genes, because only those cells that have taken up our plasmid of interest, including whatever genes we want to study, will also contain that antibiotic resistance gene. And so you can add antibiotics to the media, and at least theoretically, only your bacteria that have taken it up should be able to grow. So some of the other types of plasmids you can find, so in addition to the F factors, which confer fertility, would be R plasmids, and these are going to confer antibiotic resistance. They're often used in the lab for many different types of research. However, they are also a big problem when you look at things like antibiotic resistance, particularly in the medical fields. The rise of antibiotic resistant bacteria is one of the, the biggest problems facing our healthcare fields today. The fact of the matter is we have um, these bacteria growing and they're resistant to many, many different types of antibiotic. You may have heard of MRSA or methicillin resistant Staph aureus. It's a huge problem in uh, hospitals today. And so trying to find out different compounds that will kill these bacteria it should be a bigger priority than it really is. And the main reason for this is because there's not a lot of money in it for the drug companies right now. So one of the potential sources for new antibiotics is to look to things like soil bacterial and soil fungi, soil fungi, to look to see if they have, are creating any compounds that have potentially antimicrobial activity to them. So colplasmids are going to encode something called colicins, and this is a chemical that can kill neighboring bacteria. Things like this are good potential targets for studying new antibiotics. A fungi can also do similar sorts of things. They can create these compounds, kill off any neighboring bacteria. If we can isolate and find these, these are new potential sources of antibiotics for us. Another way that we can get genetic information exchange in bacteria is through transformation. In transformation, small pieces of extracellular DNA are get taken up by a living bacterial cell and integrated stably into the chromosome. In this case, these are just small pieces of DNA. They happen to be taken up by this cell. Many times we will take advantage of this in the lab by what we call shocking the cells. You can incubate them at cold temperatures, heat them up, and then cool them back down. When you heat them up to about 40 degrees Celsius, or 42 degrees Celsius, this will cause tiny pores or holes to form in the bacterial cell. This can then allow the uptake of these small pieces of DNA. When you cool it back down, these holes are closed and it is then stably integrated into the chromosome.